Welcome to episode 44 of What's That Sound podcast. My name's Stu Watts, and today I interviewed Talia Rose Coleman, who's a mastering engineer from Sydney. In this episode, we talked about her extensive internship at 301 Studios, as well as her tutelage with Steve Smart there, how she achieves a sense of space with her masters, as well as the importance of spreading the word about the people behind the scenes in the music production process. If you could do us a favor and spread the word about this podcast, share it on your socials, in a DM, in a conversation, wherever you feel comfortable. We want to get this out to as many people as possible, and you can help us just by doing that. Hit follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast platforms so you can stay up to date with everything new that's going on here at What's That Sound. Heaps of big stuff planned this year, so do that and you can stay in touch. If you have any suggestions or if you want to request a guest, you can send me an email, podcast.whatsthatsound at gmail.com. All of the links to everything that we talk about in this episode are in the show notes. Um, so you can click on anything that is related to myself, What's That Sound or Talia Rose in the show notes. You can check them out whenever you like. That's it. Let's get into it. No more talking from me. This is episode 44 of What's That Sound podcast. You're listening to What's That Sound with your host, Stu Watts. Welcome everyone to another episode of What's That Sound? My name's Stu Watts and today I'm here with Talia Rose Coleman. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. You're very welcome. And uh, you've come down from Sydney. So, I have. Um, you know, you're here for the MPEG Awards, which uh, congratulations for getting nominated. Thank you. That was a, <laughs> that was a big surprise, but it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to be Super recognized. Cool. Yeah. yeah, unreal. I'm looking forward to the weekend. If anyone, well, you, this will be out a month later, so you won't be able to <laughs> go there if you didn't know about it before now. But anyway, um, welcome. And um, let's, let's find out a little bit more about yourself. Like how did, how did you get into the music industry? Where did it all start? Well, when I was younger, I started playing instruments. So I started with guitar and mm -hmm. I lasted a day. Okay. It was too hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so I thought, what could be the most annoying instrument to play? And I chose drums and nice. played those for, I want to say about 10 years. Yep. Uh, all through high school, I was in bands and things like that. And it was really fun. Um, but once you get into year 12, everyone says, well, what do you want to do as a career? Mm. And I was saying, well, I, I want to be an artist. I want to be in a band. I mm -hmm. want to be a rock star. And yep. they, you know, teachers, my parents and stuff were saying, well, that's not a real job now, is it? And I can't make money off that. So I was really kind of considering, okay, well, I love music and I want to work in this industry, but what else could I do? And I'd always been really interested in whatever those people in the tents in front of concert stages yeah, are doing, yeah. you know, yeah. when you go to gigs and like even from when I was a lot younger, I would always try and stand near the tents and just kind of like peek just over. Peek. Yeah, oh, yeah. What's that? What is that yeah. big spaceship looking thing? Got no idea what it does. Yeah. But it looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. There's so many buttons, but yeah. it's really exciting. And I know yeah. it makes this cool thing happen. Yeah. Um, so I started looking into that and uh, from there I found SAE, School of Audio Engineering, although they do everything else now too. Mm. Um, and I applied for a Bachelor of Audio Engineering and I got in before um, I had even completed my HSC. So I thought, you know, Beautiful. that's fine. I didn't even need to study anymore. Like Unreal. this is cool. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I got into that. And I yeah. went to uni, um, studied that for two years. Mm -hmm. And then immediately got an internship at Studios 301 at the end. And then that was it, really. Unreal. Yeah. It's pretty smooth sailing for you. <laughs> pretty smooth. Yeah. It was just kind of like one thing to the other. It wasn't, there wasn't too much questioning in it. Like I just knew, yeah. I knew like, especially in uni, oh, this is something that I really want to do. Like the further I got through uni, the more passionate I became. Because I went in not knowing anything. Sure, like, yeah. They're like, oh, you know, reverb and compression. And I was like, I, I never heard of it. I don't, I don't know what's <laughs> going on. And everyone around me, I think there was a lot of DJs and a lot of people sure. who had kind of 
already gotten into production and stuff and I yeah. just played drums. Yeah, yeah. So I felt like such an imposter just yeah. not knowing anything. Um, so I tried really hard and and the more I got into it, the more I really appreciated the craft and mm -hmm. and then I learnt mastering there, which mm -hmm. really got me excited. Yeah. So. I want to take it a little bit back of like when you were growing up, what sort of music were you into? I'm just going to grab this. Um, gosh, I have a lot of a lot of influences. Um, I definitely went through a lot of phases. Mm -hmm. I think the first, if we want to go right back, the first artist that really got me into music was Queen. Sweet. Um, we had a greatest hits cassette. Yeah. And we went on a Pretty road sure trip. Pretty sure every family had that yeah, cassette. Yeah, everyone had that cassette. <laughs> yeah. And so we were one of them. And yeah. uh, we went on a two-week holiday up Cape York Way. So there was no access to anything and we forgot to bring other cassettes. Uh, and I, I think I was four or five and yeah. we just played that back to back and then we just swapped to the other <laughs> side, played again, and I just fell completely in love. That's awesome. Um, and then I went through to the typical like teenage emo stage where yeah. I was listening to a lot of punk yeah. and a lot of rock. Um, but I guess in a surprising way, the more that I've gotten into – engineering the more I've appreciated lots of other genres that mm -hmm. maybe before this practice I just mm. immediately was like nah can't yeah. do it I won't listen to country or I won't listen to this and then yep. now that I've got a different trained ear I listen yes. to it again and so my palate has expanded a yeah, lot absolutely I love it yeah. well um I mean it's a it's a great it's a great way to start and you know, going through the punk thing, I, I can absolutely relate to that. And I'm still the music that I listen to to this yep. day. So it's pretty <laughs> funny. But um, yeah, let, let's let's talk about, you know, when you were at school and, and learning about it, what kind of things were, were there like many, uh, uh, I'm sure there was heaps, but what were the like main aha moments where you were like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I want to really focus on this. Like you said, you learned about mastering and you're like, oh, this is really cool. What was it about that? I think when it came to mastering compared to learning mixing and learning recording, because, you know, we started with here's how to set up a microphone mm -hmm. all the way to mastering at the end of the course. Yep. Um, the the thing that surprised me about mastering was that my lecturer was barely doing anything mm. and the song just jumped out of the speakers yeah. at you and he would explain it like that you know you just gotta you just have to change a few things and then suddenly the song is out of the speakers in your face and yeah. that's what you have to achieve it doesn't yeah. feel like the song is in the speakers and it's there it really jumps out and that's how you know you've got a good master mm. like when someone listens to it on the radio that one song that you've done if it's mastered well it will jump out at them compared mm. to the rest. Yeah. And I tried and it just sounded like crap. <laughs> like to be completely honest, I, you know, if I go back and listen to my masters from when I was 18, 19, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not great. Yeah, yeah. And that encouraged me more. I was, you know, thinking this is the hardest part mm. of audio so far. Mm -hmm. I have never been so confused in my entire like uni progression yeah. than I have been now. Cool. I thought I knew what compression was. Yeah. I thought I knew what limiting <laughs> was. I thought I knew what EQ was. Yeah. And I was starting to feel really confident, like, yeah, I can mix a great track. I mm -hmm. can do all this. I, I know all the plugins now. Like it's mm. fine. Until I got to mastering and it just was like blank slate. Yeah. Start again. Yeah. So yeah, I was very determined. It's funny. It's like it it's that it's that classic thing where you learn a little bit and you, and you totally like, oh yeah, this is, this is all right. But then, you know, when you actually start to find all the little intricacies of all of the lift, like different EQs, different yep. compressors, all those sorts of things, then you're like, shit, there's way more to this than I like initially thought. It's, it's, it's like, I'm sure everyone goes through it and it's like, I, I just remember like, even when I was a teenager and stuff using like the worst software, like I think it was like acid pro or something like that <laughs> you would like chuck a compressor on like the master bus and not know what you're doing and, yep. you, and you're like oh this is sick it's like so loud and squashed and stuff and then you listen i remember listening back a few years later and going what the heck was i doing <laughs> like that's <laughs> awful but it's kind mm. of the best way to learn i yeah. think is that you kind of overcompensate with everything yeah and then as you 
you know, progress in your career, you start learning that kind of smaller changes are sometimes mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I mean, I started with all of the stock Pro Tools plugins yep. and all that back yep. in the day. Tell us about um, 301 and, and how that started and what that looked like at the start and, you know, were there people around you like teaching you like hands-on sort of stuff? Talk, talk us through that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I started at 301 when they were moving into their new building in Alexandria. So I was one of the first rounds of interns back in 2018. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my internship was quite tech heavy. So I was helping set up the studios, plugging a lot of gear cool. in, doing a lot of testing and things, which was really cool because yeah. we didn't have that training when I was mm. at uni. Like, I mean, not many people would get that. No. Unless you're setting up a studio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was this really great experience to see the bare bones of a big professional mm -hmm. studio like that. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, I want to say like the first three or four months helping set up and mm -hmm. doing most of that. And then sessions started coming in and we'd get to sit in on them. And as an intern, you roll a lot of cables mm -hmm. as you do at the start and um, serve a lot of tea and coffee. So there yeah. wasn't a lot of hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. Like we're dealing with very expensive microphones and stuff. Totally. There's, you know, been cases of people dropping them in the past. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's completely fair that they're not quite ready to let these newbies yeah. Yeah, <laughs> touch yeah. the gear. Especially with such a, like a, you know, 301 is such a, she's it's a, just yeah. such a huge name and like obviously one of the biggest studios in Australia. So it's like, it's yeah. totally understandable. They've got to have, they've got to set the standards. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a high standard of professionalism and mm -hmm. the clientele that they get, you know, that yep. you have to meet that as well. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of giving that five-star hospitality experience. Mm. So it's a very slow progression going through an old school studio like mm. that. Yeah. Um, you really have to do all of the boring stuff mm -hmm. to prove that you've got the commitment and the attention to detail totally, yeah. in just packing the dishwasher to yeah. prove that you have the attention to detail to <laughs> do the patch bay for the wow. next session. Yeah, it's um, great. And I guess I must have proven that mm -hmm. in some way. Um, well, I think uh, obviously it just takes, I mean, I, I've seen it so many times, even just me as an individual engineer where people will reach out and they'll say, hey, can I come and, you know, learn how to mix or sit in on a session, things like that. And I'm like, great, absolutely come through. I have no issues with that. Yep. And you see them once and then they don't show up again. Yeah. I'm I'm sure that happens all the time. So it's like definitely even just committing and showing that you're, wanting to be there is such a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, a big commitment and like I was young, so I wasn't at a point where I needed, you know, a full-time job or something. Mm -hmm. So I could give the hours up. That's and, awesome. um, at the end of my internship, I turned to them and I said, well, I'll see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just coming back. Yeah. Um, and then I stayed interning for the whole year. Okay. It is only a three month internship. Sure. Um, and in that time I met Steve Smart yep. and when he was hanging around the cafe area and mm -hmm. stuff, I wouldn't bombard him, but I'd ask a question or two, yep. you know, about mastering. And, uh, eventually, <clears throat> yeah, he came up to me one day, I was dusting or, you know, doing something around yep. the studios and he said, Hey, you know, are you busy tomorrow? And I said, no, why? <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm remastering some old midnight oil tapes do you want to come in and assist me tomorrow? Richard. I was like, yeah, cool. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get you to run the tape machine. Do you know how to do that? And I said, sure. And he's like, okay, cool. See you tomorrow, you know, 10 a.m. And I immediately turned around and got my phone out. I was like, how, how do you use a tape machine? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know. It was the first time yeah, I'd yeah. ever used one. Um, and I came in the next day and he's like, yeah, yeah, just, you know, put it all together, tension them, hit play. Uh, you know, I stood there. I didn't do it. I hit play and it just spun off. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'm fired. Yeah. It's, it's all over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was like, no, it's complete. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and so that was that was my first day with Steve. Yeah. Um, and it's really cute. He's got a photo of us on that first day on his Instagram page. Oh, yeah. It's a photo of me standing behind him. Um, but he didn't tell any of the managers. Right. So they came up to the door and they're like, 
what are you, what are you doing in here? <laughs> like, are you, are you annoying Steve? Because Steve doesn't let anyone in his studio. Right. He's a very kind of private engineer. Yep, yep. So they're all a bit concerned, <laughs> thinking maybe I had forced my way in. Um, yeah, and then he just took me on and yeah, nice. kept showing me the ropes from there. Yeah. Tell us about that. Tell us about some of the, like, key learning, um, you know, things from that time. It was a, you know, what I thought I knew about mastering from uni. Mm. I just had to wipe that all clean and start again, mm. which is another thing about mastering. It's just every time you think you know, mm. you don't know. Mm. And Steve is 100% analog. Mm. So I was learning again from scratch awesome. how to master. Such a cool way to learn. Yeah, before that it, I was just doing in the box because yep. I had my own gear and obviously a 20-year-old can't afford yeah. outboard oh, gear. Yeah. I still can't. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> um, so it was it was a big curveball. I would stand next to him and he'd, you know, bypass something and go, can you hear that? And mm -hmm. it would be like 840 hertz at plus 0. 0.2 over dB. Yeah, yeah. And he's putting it in his eyes. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you hear that? <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think. And, you know, he'd say, okay, well, pay attention to the ring of the snare mm. or pay attention yeah. to, like, the beater of the kick. Now listen to it again. And then I'd hear it because mm -hmm. he'd tell me where to focus. So we spent a lot of time where he'd kind of start showing me how to train my ears yep. in that sense. Um, and when he said, you know, I'd love you to come in and start mastering in here, um, I was like, that's really cool, but I don't feel ready. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, well, the best thing you can do is know these speakers in this room, yeah. like the back of your hand. Yeah. So you need to come in here as soon as I'm finished for the day. Like he works, you know, nine to five. Mm -hmm. He said, as soon as I finish up, come in the studio and just listen. Mm. And he probably said that at the beginning of maybe 2020. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell him that I was ready to start mastering until August of 2021. Yeah, wow. So I spent almost two years just mm -hmm. sitting and listening. Yeah. Another thing he got me to do was to bring up his old sessions and I would try and master them. Yeah. And then I'd compare great. it to his master. Yeah, unreal. And he was like, oh, you know, you probably, you, you might master some of them better than me. And yeah. I'm thinking, that's no way. Yeah. <laughs> There's absolutely no way. Yeah. But doing that, working on his gear and then A being to his and going, how? Mm. How did you get that? And mm. then trying to emulate until I yeah, matched it. Yeah, the reverse it. engineering yeah. part of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, that's, taste comes into it. Like, Everyone's individual. Mm -hmm. Everyone has different ways of listening, different ways of like liking certain things and stuff. So you're going to pay attention to different stuff than he did. Oh, and, definitely. And, and that sort of thing. So there, there's no reason why you couldn't um, have done a better master in some circumstances. So yeah, it's it's just one of those things when you're early on. You, I mean, it's the imposter syndrome of it all. It's like. How could I? How could I possibly? You've been doing this for 30 years or <laughs> yep. whatever. Yeah. Well, um, you know, fast forward a little bit now, you, you've, you've been doing it for quite a while now and, you've, you know, you've got a bunch of masters under your belt. So, yeah. like, what does your process look like these days? It's a little bit more hybrid um, compared to how I started off with Steve. Mm -hmm. um, I do get a lot of electronic music and a lot of dance music. Mm -hmm. Not sure how I ended up in that scene, <laughs> but someone found me and then my name got put out there. But yep. I, I love that music as well. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't quite translate 100% on analog gear. Mm. So I do try and do a bit of a mix. Um, and like you said, like we all have our own styles and how we do our work. Mm. And I think I've gotten to a space where I've got my own sound now yep. um, in my hybrid system and I think people are starting to know me for that particular sound, cool. which is really cool. Um, but it's ever changing. Mm -hmm. Like even just last week I was trying out new plugins mm -hmm. and going, I wonder what this would sound like on a master and it mm. surprised me and, you yep. know, I'm like well, maybe I'll put that in my chain. I'm not sure. So, so what sort of things do you look for when you're trying to like trying out new stuff or, you know, when you're doing a master on the same gear, even what sort of specific things you're listening for? I guess it depends on the genre. Um, when it comes to gear, because mastering is so diverse, mm -hmm. um, I could sit down for a day, start with a full on house track, 
then go to punk rock, mm -hmm. then do a classical piece. Um, it like you, you're not stuck in one niche. You're mm -hmm. really kind of able to do everything. Yeah. So a lot of the gear and the plugins and stuff that I think about need to be quite versatile in working for everything. Mm. Obviously I've got, you know, different gear or different plugins that might have a particular color that mm -hmm. works better for rock mm. or works better for pop vocals yeah. and things like that. Um, but when I sit down with a track, it's, it's hard to explain because I'm at a point where I sit down and I already know what I'm going to do yeah, yeah. as I'm listening yeah. to it. Um, you know, sometimes there'll be tracks that need a lot of work and I might have to consider, okay, this piece of gear is probably not going to work mm -hmm. or I think it will. Like sometimes you might get a multi-band out for, you know, a dance track mm -hmm. and you put it on and then it doesn't quite work in yeah. this instance. It might, you still want that kind of organic feel, not too yeah, compressed. Yeah. Um, but most of the time I'll start listening and already know, okay, you know, I need to do this type of EQ mm. and I'm only going to use a very light compression. So I'll use yeah. even a fab filter or maybe an isotope or the alpha compressor that I had at 301 mm -hmm. worked on everything, mm -hmm. you know. So well, it's like, it's, it's like you were saying with the speakers, you have to, you have to really understand your tools mm -hmm. before you even go to touch them because yep. it's like, it's, yeah, you can learn by playing in a, the best way to learn, but when it comes to actually doing a job, you have to know the approach before you even start. Yeah, you have to. It, it, it's and it only comes with practice as well. It's like, you know, it's say for example, if I'm producing an artist, if they show me the song, the first time I hear a song, I'm thinking of what I can do with yeah. it and, and things like that. So it's a similar thing with mastering. It's like you. You just take it all in and things just hit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that was something that Steve told me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He said, you're going to sit down at this desk and you're going to just know where you end up on the desk every time. Yeah. Like you don't stop to consider. Mm -hmm. You just go with it. Instinct. And you, yeah, it's all instinct. Yeah. And that's when you know that you're in the right spot. You're, mm -hmm. You know your craft. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to that stage where everything is now just instinctual and I don't mm -hmm. sit there A, being two different mm -hmm. frequencies that are like five hertz apart going, oh, yeah. it's which one? Yeah. You know, you kind of just know what's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and it obviously makes the process a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Like when I was starting, it'd take me ages to master a song because yeah. I just wasn't confident, you know? Yeah, well, talk, talk, talk through that. Like when you're obviously learning something to, to begin with, you're having, you're second guessing yourself, you're going, should I use this one or should I use that one? What key things sped up your process? Definitely solidifying your chain early on, I think. Even if you're like getting, like I said, plugins or gear, mm -hmm. for a lot of people it's probably just plugins mm -hmm. that are quite versatile to work with all different genres is yep. probably a really good start. So, mm -hmm. you know, fab filters, very clean, isotope, ozone's very clean, yep. love both of them. Yep. Then you could, if you've got any waves or if you've got a plug-in alliance subscription, mm -hmm. you might be able to get some colored plugins mm -hmm. as well. Set your chain up so you might have a DS, a EQ, a couple of compressors there, mm -hmm. a limiter, you know, just have your go-to chain so every time you just open it up mm -hmm. and you're not questioning what plug-in mm -hmm. yeah. because if you're not too confident from the start, just, just have the ones that you know mm. and then start working from there and then yeah. and really just if your gut is telling you straight away I should try this frequency and just mm -hmm. do it and if you're not 100% sure like even as an example a couple of weeks ago I did a master for an artist and I felt like it was good but then I wanted to try a second print with it was like the slightest EQ change. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'm just not 100% <laughs> sure. And it's not usual for me to be a, sure. you know, a little unsure, but yeah, in yeah. this instance I was like, is it is it take A or is it take a B? I yeah. don't know. Yeah. But I have time before I need to send it to the client. So you know what? I'm going to put that aside. Sweet. I've got my two prints there. I'm just going to take a break. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to a different track. I'll go have a cup of tea, take a walk. Yeah. And then I probably waited, you know, half a day or something. And then I sat down, I listened to the two tracks again and went, it was A. Yeah. Straight up, it was A. It's great. So instead of just sitting there and pondering and kind of 
not panicking, but overthinking yeah. of what you're doing. You know, just try and work efficiently, see okay. how you feel with it. And then if you can take a break, then come back with fresh ears. Yeah. It's always a good way to do it. Well, I love a couple of points that you brought up there. Was the first one was starting with plugins that are, you know, pretty much clean and don't have any like coloration and adding too much because, you know, people, I think generally speaking, the cleaner is easier to process, right, mm -hmm. as a listener. Mm -hmm. You're listening to a clean song. You're like, yep, it all just works. And so if you're starting at that point, you can get it to a point where it's like, this is great. Yeah. And I heard a, I heard an analogy um, the other day of, uh, I think it was uh, producer Mike Pletnikov. Anyway, I can't remember his full name. But he was talking about how he likes to get things to, to vanilla. Yeah. And he's like, vanilla is <laughs> a great flavor. Lots of people like vanilla. But then if you want to have a different flavor, yep. then you can add it. You know, and, and I thought that was a really cool analogy. And it, and it works for that as well because yeah, you're yeah, starting yeah. at a point where it's super clean, it all works, and it gets to that point then you can always add extra. Yeah. And, you know, I try to think about that with the mixing as well. Um, but the other point was um, where – actually, I've forgotten the other point now. I've gone so deep into that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's – I mean, that's great. And I love, um, you know, unpacking different tracks and get, getting A, Bing stuff and just moving on and finding the the right point and then being okay with it. And I've – and one thing I like to do when I'm mixing or – even mastering sometimes is like get it to 80% and then send it off as the first bounce. Yep. And then you can always add extra stuff in the revision because you're generally going to get a revision, not for mastering necessarily, but for mixing, you're yep. probably going to get at least one revision. So you can always fix those extra things, get what the client thinks of it, mm -hmm. get their feedback because they're going to have something to say anyway. Yep. And it's a quicker approach because you're getting it sent off sooner. Yeah. You can get their feedback quicker. You can make the second revision quicker. It just makes things move a lot faster. So yeah, I'm, I'm right on board with that. It's, it's such a cool process. Um, what do you think when you're, you know, listening to a track for the first time and it might be a different gen genre, maybe something that you haven't worked in, what is a great sounding mix and what what do you love when it comes to you and you're like, Spot on. Well, obviously when I get it in the room that I'm working in, because I know the space so well mm -hmm. and mastering speakers, um, generally are like putting a magnifying glass up to a tra track. So mm -hmm. if there's any issues, I can hear them immediately. Absolutely. And yeah. A lot of the 301 engineers used to say, oh, I hate coming in here and listening <laughs> to my mixes. Oh, it's, it sounds so weird and different. But to me, I'm like, well, this is great because it's, it's nice and flat so I yeah. can hear everything, and you know. Mm. Um, so when I get a mix and listen to it for the first time, I, you know, I know if someone's been in a room where they haven't treated the bass properly because it just mm -hmm. comes in and it's boomy or they've mm -hmm. just got no top end or, you know, those things, yeah, you can fix them. But mm -hmm. then there's mixes I'll get and I listen to it and I'm like, all I have to do is add some sparkle. Mm. And that's, that's lovely. It's not yeah. corrective. It's just adding the magic touch. Which, the sweetness. <laughs> yeah, which a lot of people don't know what that is in mastering. Yeah. They're like, I don't know what you did or what you do, but that's nice. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really good. Yeah. Uh, so it's always a nice time when I get a track and I'm like, I don't have to do anything. And I'll mm. always tell the artist or the mix engineer if I know them, I'll actually email or message them and say, hey, spot on mix. That mm. was really good. Beautiful. Like I had a really good time working yeah. on that, you know. Um, and then sometimes like I get mixes from engineers who are just starting out. So of course yeah. it's not always going to be as polished mm -hmm. as someone who's been mixing for 30 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I'm in analog, I have to write all of my notes out by hand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a good mix might be like a line or two and a mix that has got a lot of issues. I might have half a page of yeah, notes. Right. And if that's the case and I know that I can fix it without fixing it, so to speak, mm. I'll master it. But if there is something that's just too out of pocket, I'll send it back yeah. and ask for changes. Yeah. But yeah, you, you know, you bring it up and mm. you just feel like, oh, this is going to be great. Mm. Like, yeah. Hey, thanks so much for listening so far. There is plenty more to come, so don't go anywhere. I just wanted to let you know that this podcast is made completely independently by myself with no sponsors. So if you like what you hear and you would like to show your support, you can send a donation to the PayPal link 
paypal.me slash what's that sound. The link is also in the show notes. Thanks so much for your support and let's get back to it. I'm always fascinated with mastering engineers is the, the creative approach to it because so much of it is technical. You know, you're, you're creative in the sense of you using your ears and you're knowing what to go to, but you understand the gear so well that like you said, it's just all instinct, instinct, where, what point do you get to be creative when you're mastering? I think there's a lot of creativity when it comes to how we add our own flavor to a master. Mm -hmm. So if I compare myself to the other mastering engineers at 301 as an example, because mm -hmm. they're the guys that I've worked with for so long, yep. if we all had the same track and mastered it, it would come out completely yeah. different yeah. every time. Yep. And the way that we add our creativity is in how we choose our gear and how we respond to things. Mm. So I guess in in my sense, something that I really like to work with is space mm -hmm. and not by just chucking, you know, a, an imaging tool on there mm -hmm. and, you know, doing stuff like that, but playing with EQ and compression to really kind of bring out that 360 mm. experience that, you know, whatever's hiding that you didn't really notice mm. before. And I got a lot of comments before I even knew I was doing this Yeah, cool. from artists going, I you've just added so much space or Depth, there's these yeah. things that I'm hearing now that I didn't hear before. This is so cool. amazing. And I'm looking at my notes going, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> do anything to the stereo width. I don't like, yeah. okay. And so I started kind of paying attention to, okay, how am I working and what is creative about this? That's, you know, adding that. And it was just, the way that I was using my EQ because mm -hmm. when it's not corrective work, mm -hmm. it is all just adding magic mm -hmm. and without spilling all the secrets, yeah, yeah. you know, there's, there's special frequencies here and there in different tracks that you know that like between that and particular ratios on compressors, mm -hmm. you can just suddenly just everything just yep. comes up. Just pops out yeah. like you were saying earlier. Yeah, so I think that's how we do our creative stuff is yeah. through these kind of secret little flourishes that yeah. are our own. Absolutely. I love it. Now, um, being around like a bunch of people around 301, there's people coming in and out all the time. I'm, I haven't been there, but I can imagine. Um, different engineers, different ways of working. What What is that like? Is there, is it, is every day different in, in the sense of like, conversation and unpacking the the music world and stuff like that and how does that influence the way that you work yeah it's um well obviously you know I've I'm now freelancing so it's a bit quieter than it was at mm -hmm. 301 but it, it was a revolving door of different artists and mm -hmm. different engineers and I definitely attribute a lot of my growth and knowledge to just being in the hallways and, mm. and chatting with other engineers and, you know, oh, what are you up to today? Oh, do you want to come in and listen? Sure. <laughs> you know, you walk yeah. into their room and, yeah. you know, they're mixing some cool track and you go, oh, how did you get the vocals to sound like that? Yeah. You know, they quickly, oh, have you seen this plugin? Like yeah, I just yeah. found it. It's really cool. And so, you know, everyone's like sharing their little <laughs> yeah. tips and tricks, so you know, tricks and stuff, which is, um, yeah, really fun. And then you get to meet a lot of artists as well mm -hmm. and, and how they kind of work creatively. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's just a really nice hub mm. to kind of bounce off each other and yep. and learn. And I guess going freelance, you kind of miss that a little bit because mm. um, you don't you can't quite just step outside and go, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Who's going to answer? And that's something that I had before. If, you know, I was mastering and I thought, oh, I just, I've got a question about something. I could go down the hall and mm. Harvey O'Sullivan is there or Ben Feggins or Andrew Edgson. Like all of them were just around the corner and yeah. I couldn't ask them. Or, you know, when you've got a track that does X, how do yeah. you achieve Y? Yeah, yeah. And they go, well, this is how I do it. No mm -hmm. one no one kept secrets. Yeah. And that was really cool. Well, I mean, that's something that I've noticed just even by having this podcast is people are happy to talk. And I think um, it's important once – you've been doing it for a while and you've learned a whole bunch of things to, to, to safeguard everything, to be a gatekeeper on the process or, you know, you don't have to give, like you were saying, you don't have to give all your secrets away, but 
the conversation around things or the approach to something, you can only help people by having those conversations and by, yeah. by shutting yourself off from that or even by not allowing yourself to ha- ask questions of other people and stuff, you're yeah. really stopping yourself and others from learning from each other. And I think that's one of the best things about music is like it's endless. It's in- infinite. The possibilities yeah. are infinite. So being open to conversation is it's key. Like it's one of the best things that you can do. Oh, definitely. And being like willing to admit that you don't know everything. Like I wouldn't say I'm the best mastering engineer and I know everything and I've already hit my goals. Oh, I'll be learning for the next 20 years. and Forever. Yeah. yeah. Plus, yeah. You, you know. Yeah. And I, I've i already started, you know, mentoring and mm-hmm. helping younger engineers come through and mm-hmm. my door is always open mm-hmm. to people. And I learn things from them, you know, and yep. that's great. Mm-hmm. Even though they are learning from me and they think that I'm the, the master. <laughs> <laughs> um you know, there's so many things that I learned from them because I'll say, well, what would you do in this situation? And, yeah. you know, they'll say something and yeah. maybe I'd not thought of that. Yeah, and absolutely. I it, mean, it's, cool. it's one of the, it, it's so cool to get different just perspectives on stuff. And, you know, I liken that to, I, I have this all of the time when I'm producing is, people probably heard me say it a bunch on the podcast, is like just just unpacking things that you didn't know or didn't have the um, thought process around because everyone specializes in things and just because it's not directly linked to what you do as an engineer, as a producer, whatever, doesn't mean that you can't learn from what their approach. Yep. And, you know, it might be like a pedal board setup or something random like yeah. that, but you can still go, Oh shit, I never even thought about it <laughs> yeah. like that way. And it'll just change the way that you think about something. Oh yeah. 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 Tell us about things that like, you know, we talked about learning we've talked about how you get better at things what sort of you know for lack of a better term brick walls were in the way or what hurdles did you have to to get over to you know was there things that popped up a lot or was it kind of a like always different things that kind of ooh, what's that or that's difficult in, in terms of the the sound and like I guess just like learning the craft and and the process and all that sort of stuff what what sort of things popped up that that made it difficult? I think, oh, that's a good one. Um, I don't think there was anything consistent that popped up too much other than I guess for myself I'm not, even though it's in our title that we're engineers, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm the most technical engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and being a a young person working in old school analog, sure, one of yeah. the biggest hurdles is there's a, this is just making a weird sound and I don't understand what's happening. And mm-hmm. I, you know, not understanding the signal flow of the room properly. That was a big learning mm-hmm. curve. Uh, you know, it's very easy nowadays being in the box and mm. you have to just have a two channel out. Yep. Um, that was a huge process that would stop me a lot of times where I just didn't fully understand the setup mm-hmm. or if gear broke and Steve wasn't there mm. and I'd be calling him and I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, you just got to, you got to do the blah, 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 with the <laughs> you know, and to me, it's just, just like, no I, language, don't, yeah. I don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, like, yeah. I really don't. Yeah. So that was a big hurdle mm-hmm. and I'm still learning. People mm-hmm. always ask me, oh, can you explain this? And I say, mm-hmm. No. I use it <laughs> and, you know, I, I know how to make music sound good with it. But yeah. the the process of that gear, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the biggest hurdle is that yeah. I'm not too technical. I'm just – I'm more creative. I just feel like an artist and if it breaks, I'm like <laughs> – But I, th- I think a lot of us newer engineers can absolutely relate to that. I mean, I – I, I agree. I'm not, I'm, I'm nerdy in the sense of I absolutely love music and I will dissect it and I love the songwriting process and production. That's to me where I get engineer heavy is like mm-hmm. I engineer the recording process of songwriting and producing. Yeah. But like I have no interest in pulling apart gear. If something breaks, I'll just replace it. You know? <laughs> Some people love that. They love tinkering. Yeah. They love buying new things and have, I'm always like I just make do with what I've got, yeah. you know. And so... And especially when, you know, certain things are so expensive, it's like, like you were saying earlier, you just, you just learn with the, the, the thing that's going to cover the most bases and then, and then you learn from there. 
But I guess let's talk about, you know, becoming a freelancer and, and things like that. What sort of things popped up when you were freelancing that were different to being at 301 and, and being around all those people? What sort of different challenges do you have now? Oh, well, obviously the biggest challenge is stepping away from the room that I was just working in for mm. six years. Mm. Uh, that's a really big step because you have to retrain your ears to a new space. Mm. Um, I'm now slowly building a new workflow because I was still in 100% analog up until January when I left. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going back to a hybrid system yeah. and trying to learn that again and going, oh, I can I can use plugins today. Yeah, oh, yeah. interesting. Okay. And <laughs> so it's it's a slow process. Like obviously I've already started working in this realm and everyone's still liking the masters and, mm -hmm. it, you know, it still sounds good. Um, one of the, I guess as an aside, one of the good things is that when I was at 301, I've had these biodynamic um, 990s. Mm -hmm. And I've had them since I was 18. Mm -hmm. So I've had them for such a long time. Yep. Just know how it sounds. Yep. Yeah, that I had them in that studio and I've got them in this studio mm -hmm. so I can reference everything back to those as well and go, okay, if it's sounding good in those, mm -hmm. I know that this is correct. Mm -hmm. um, but it it is a big challenge starting again. Yeah. Uh, being in a different room is yeah. like such a big part of it. I've been in three different rooms in this place and they were all vastly different yep. and the room sizes are the, the same. Like, why is it so different? It's, yeah. it, it's everything, everything like that just changes so much, yeah. especially mastering where everything is exposed and yeah. it relies so much on the listening environment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. It's, yeah. it's a lot. So I think it will take a while to completely like dial into the room mm -hmm. and get quite comfortable, but I'm confident enough in my own, skills as an engineer mm -hmm. um and you know i have i have wave labs and it's got spectrum analyzers mm. and all of those cool tech things so i know yeah. where my track is sitting at all times yeah um i guess at this point i'm doing a lot more cross-referencing to other speakers and other situations mm -hmm. just to double check until i fully get confident in this space yeah um, but that I would say is, yeah, it's a big challenge. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. It's like chopping your ears off and <laughs> yeah. starting again. Oh, totally. Well, talk us about, uh, talk to us about when, you know, freelancing is such a different, um, way of working as opposed to working under people. And I know that I've gone through that here. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of the challenges of freelancing and finding clients and things like that. What's kind of your approach about finding new clients and how does that usually work? A lot of what I do is just posting on social media. I'm not very good at selling, you know, my services and promoting myself. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of engineers can relate to that. It's really hard work mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get out there and say, you know, spend I'm your good. money Hire on me. me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Put all your money into me, you yeah. know. You know I'll do a good job. Yeah. It's, it feels awful doing mm. that and it's really hard to get over the imposter syndrome when you put yourself out there like that. Mm. I was fortunate at 301 that being under that name meant that I had free advertising because mm -hmm. a lot of people would go there for mastering, see me on the website and go, well, she seems cool or, mm -hmm. you know, they'll write mm -hmm. in the notes, I listened to your portfolio and it mm -hmm. sounds great. Mm -hmm. Some people, I think they went, she's the cheapest option, right. which is totally fine. You know, yeah. doesn't mean that it's that a bad happens. master. No. Um, nowadays that I'm, you know, now that I'm freelancing, I do have to spend a bit more time kind of working on this. And I've got a few partnerships with organizations and stuff that mm -hmm. I've set up that hopefully my website's in, you know, work in progress right mm -hmm. now. But once it's up, I'll be able to, you know, let people know. Mm -hmm. And word of mouth, mm. I go to a lot of gigs right. and I meet a lot of artists that way yep. and just say, you know, hey, I'm an engineer and or, I, you know, I go to a gig and I like what they're doing and I'll add them. Mm -hmm. And even if I don't just message them directly or anything, but, you know, down the track, I might just say, you know, I, I saw you at a gig and you mm. sounded great. Yep. Um, I'm not one of those people who will just cold DM, yeah. you know. It never works, honestly. No, it doesn't. The the best thing that I've found is just word of mouth. Yeah. You do a good master once or a good mix or a mm -hmm. good recording session, that artist goes away, 
tells two of their artist friends mm. and it just spreads. And yeah. so for the past, I want to say the past two years, I haven't done any self promotion mm. because it's all just organically been growing, it's which great. is nice, Fantastic. you know. And, and, you know, I think that happens for a lot of engineers. They get to a stage where they've just kind of done enough work where it just organically mm. will come to them. Yep. And then you have all of your clients who will just return mm. and that will kind of make up all of your consistent work. And then yep. you just try and fill in the little spots here yep. and there with, you know, new clients or new yep. work. So. And I think also those, those little gaps are great times to work on your business and mm -hmm. just keep improving all of the back end stuff yep. that needs to get done. Because I mean, when you're not freelancing, other people take care of stuff. Yeah. But when you're freelancing, everything falls on you. So if yeah. you don't update your playlists or if you don't update your website, if you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't post on social media, mm -hmm. it's just a missed opportunity. Yeah. And before when I said cold DMs don't work, it's not that they don't work. It's that there's an approach to it that a lot of people um, try the most basic approach of like, hey, how you going? I, I'm an engineer. Here's my stuff. Yep. People are too switched on these days with social media and and so that's why those approaches don't work. But, you know, like you said, when you follow someone, when you've seen them at a gig or something mm -hmm. and you reach out and you say, hey, that the gig was awesome, you played sweet, and then you get to talking and then they find you on socials yep. and they see that you're an engineer, those are those more organic. It's still somewhat of a cold thing because you're, you're following them or you're saying good day out yep. of nowhere but there's a connection there. Yeah. And I think that's really important that if even artists that might be hearing this is like, there's always a way to approach someone that you don't know that just involves a little bit of groundwork first. And you need those connections. It can't just be kind of out of the blue. Yeah. Go to their gig, go say good day. If you like, if you like them and you want to work on their stuff, <laughs> have a way to talk to them yeah. first before actually just saying, Hey, I'm an engineer. I want to work, work on your stuff. It's yeah. like, just try yeah. and find, you know, kind of what what degrees of connection you have. Like, mm. or maybe you worked with an artist that they've been on the same bill yep. with, you know, or something like that. You can. There's yep. always ways. Like mm -hmm. the music industry in Australia is incredibly small. Yep. You go and find a new artist that you think is cool and you see that they've got 40 mutuals already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's some yeah. type of in, yes. um, in, in that way. A another really good thing is having the artists that you've worked with mm -hmm. tagging you on their socials and saying, yeah. you know, this is the song that's out. Here are all the credits mm -hmm. or uploading the credits to all of the crediting websites like yeah. Jackster and Discogs and all that. Yep. That's really important and mm -hmm. I think that does get missed a bit yep. um, and I don't think Australia does too well at ensuring that people mm -hmm. do Absolutely. keep on top of I their credits. That. That's why MPEG is so good. Yeah. I'll shout them out every <laughs> single time. They're shout doing, out MPEG. Doing great stuff and <laughs> hopefully that starts to change with um, yep. all of the, the things that, that, that have been talked about. Um, for that. So absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's so important to be credited, but I think we can only control what we have control over. And so we can suggest to our clients that they do this and that. Yep. But again, if we don't do something, then it just doesn't get done. And so for me, it's like making sure every time a new release comes out, I'll share it on my page. Mm -hmm. If like it's clients that I've worked with, share it on my stories, share it on my page, tag them, tag everyone that's involved. Yep. And that's my part to spread the word of everyone that's involved in that yep. project. And it's just paying it forward. It's like, again, if I didn't do it, it wouldn't get done yep. and therefore it might just reach less peace, less people. Yeah. So the more that I can do to – because it benefits me if my clients get more successful. Yeah, it's like marketing it's, both ways. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. What – um. What sort of things like continue to surprise you? Um, you know, I'm I'm still in the first ten years of doing this. You are too. Like, what sort of things keep popping up and surprising you about maybe the music industry or clients or or that sort of thing? Hmm. I mean, I think something that does surprise me still is probably the lack of knowledge about what we as engineers do, mm -hmm. um, even in the wider industry, but also outside of the industry, there's not a lot of knowledge around 
the engineering side of this creative process that we're in. Mm -hmm. And that surprises me. Mm. Like the film industry is quite transparent and Mm -hmm. people understand what colour gradists are Mm. and editors Mm. and visual effects people. They all understand that. And everyone listens to music every day, but there's not quite that education and understanding. Mm. And so I think it surprises me how often the engineers are kind of left behind Mm. and not seen. And, you know, shout out MPEG again for changing that. It's really exciting. But that's been quite surprising. Mm. Even artists not fully understanding what we do. Totally. um, That's a big surprise. I think the thing about, you know, being an engineer or a producer or anything like that is up until five or ten years ago, the only things we saw of studios were like quick little snippets behind the scenes on DVDs or, you know, on a special mm-hmm. or something like that. We just never had the insight into what goes on in an actual session. Yeah. And it's like, again, it's, it's, it is on us to be sharing that sort of stuff. It's important that, you know, we're constantly showcasing the work that we do and giving an insight into it and spreading the word about, like, and I mean, that's why I do this podcast. Like it's, it's really important to me that we educate as many people as we can about the way things work. And you just never know who you're going to like captivate with it. You know what I mean? And like, there's nothing cooler than music. There's nothing cooler than what I do in my opinion. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Someone else feels that way. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, It's, uh, it is changing slowly Mm. and hopefully, you know, as, you know, social media kind of increases, we can get more understanding of what we do Mm -hmm. and kind of help us to to help them in a way, you know? Yeah. Let's talk through, um, let's get geeky and talk through (laughs) some of your favorite tools, uh, whether that's hardware or software, what, what do you love, love to use in a session? I think I've already mentioned it earlier, but I think the Elysia Alpha compressor is probably my favorite piece of gear and if I have to save every penny to get another one (laughs) I will yeah what's so good about it it just makes the song sound amazing every time yeah it's so clean it's so smooth it doesn't sound like you're compressing something you know Mm -hmm. sometimes you use a compress and you're like oh yeah that's that's being compressed (laughs) I can hear that yeah it's yeah it's just so versatile and beautiful Mm -hmm. and musical Mm. so that's you know a piece of gear that just is you know just an amazing piece of gear yeah i think that everyone should have one (laughs) (laughs) i will say though the plug-in versions don't quite compare because i was thinking i love this gear so much you know i'll i'll get the the plug-in equivalent and i started playing with it yeah see i've got it on the plug-in alliance bundle and i've i've used uh, I think I've used it once or twice, but it never done it. Never done anything for me. But yeah, it's hardware is different. Hardware is different. Ball game. different. Yeah. Hardware is definitely yeah, different. Um, so that is beautiful. Um, another piece of gear, like these are Steve's choices. So I didn't get to choose any of mm-hmm. that outboard gear. I came into his chain, and honestly, per, you know, Just perfection is yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 <laughs> he knew yeah, what he was choosing. Yeah. Um, the the Sontech EQ mm-hmm. uh, was just stunning yeah. again it's quite it's not too musical for mm. an eq this is all mastering stuff <laughs> yeah but, absolutely you know it can work on mixes and things because mm. it is very clean but the the top end on that eq you could put it you know a high shelf from mm. like 12k up mm. boost it up to like plus six mm. dbs and it's not sharp yeah yeah it's just magical uh, yeah. you know and it's and it's so lovely to have a piece of gear that does that because yeah. top end is something that is always you know a bit of an issue yeah. right yeah. things are always you know too sibilant or mm-hmm. too sharp mm-hmm. and it's always a battle i think with a lot of mixing engineers because i'll get stuff and it's mm. it's just too dark now mm-hmm. because their speakers the have way. yeah they've yeah. gone they've overcompensated mm. so i need to bring that back somehow mm-hmm. or try and balance it out a little bit more um and that's it's just stunning works mm-hmm. every time love it uh going to plugins mm-hmm. which you know plugins are wonderful mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Plugins are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really do love Isotope Ozone. Yeah. Um, what are we up to? Nine? Ten. Or eight? Eight? Ten. Mm. Okay, yeah. Mm. Whatever the latest is, mm. I think I might be on the version just before, before yep. that. Yeah. Um, but I've been using it since I was a teenager when mm. I started out, yeah. when it was seven or six yeah. or something. So I... It's, again, something that you can use on everything. Yeah. It's very helpful. Like it, if you mm. don't know something, you just mastering kind of. Assistant. Yeah, <laughs> well, the mastering assistant is interesting. But in it's terms of um, if you don't understand how a, a knob or something doesn't, you know, works on the gear, it will give you a rundown. Mm. I know like Ableton, the software does mm. that too. Yep. It's got that little help bar. Yeah, yeah. Isotope does that. So when you're a newbie starting mm. out, you're like, I don't understand what gain yeah, or, or yeah. release or attack or yeah. what what ratio is mm -hmm. or, or the knee mm -hmm. of a compressor yeah. it, you know it'll explain that yeah and there's so many different things in there that like i really like their um their vintage compressor that's really nice mm -hmm. their maximizer is really clean yeah. as well and yep. it's got so many different options mm -hmm. i could I don't now, but I used to spend a lot of time just clicking between like yeah. ISC know, one yeah. and two and three going, I don't know which <laughs> yeah. one. And yep. now obviously I'm like, well, I'm going straight no for that one because yep. I know. Um, and then Some of, of course, their exciter modules are really the cool. The exciters well. are nice, yeah, but you so have to cool. be careful. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you can, Not in a mix you don't, but in a master, absolutely. absolutely yeah. yeah, you can yep. even if you just like go from point one to like point two yeah. and suddenly everything's like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, be careful with that if you yeah. go into it for those who are listening. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, fab filter, mm -hmm. just always great. Yep. Um, I tend to use, uh, especially the L2. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good limiter. I yep. tend to go to that over isotope or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, color, I really like some Amtex stuff. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Um, I've used once or twice the Shadow Hills. That's yep. that's always nice, but you got to be careful with that one. You mm -hmm. can overdo it really mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. Uh, one thing I really like, it's like a happy accident, was I, I think I was going to click on a different compressor and it's in the one of the plug-in alliance bundles. Mm. It's the like the BX town yeah townhouse townhouse. Yeah, it's based on the SSL yeah. um, bus compressor. Yeah. yeah, and like I've got the SSL bus mm -hmm. you know plugins as well, yep. and I've used it, and I've never really liked the plug-in mm. version. Mm. Every time I put it on, everything's feeling too compressed, mm -hmm. and I've never felt quite you know comfortable with it, yep. even in mixing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just one day, I don't know, I was just aiming for something yeah. else and I accidentally hit that one <laughs> and it popped up and I was like, this looks fun. Yeah. It's just such a nice glue yeah. compressor. Yep. It's just beautiful. Yep. So that's just a little one that, mm -hmm. you know, I will might add on the end of my yep. chain or something yep. for a, a bit of extra oomph. Love it. Some some awesome <laughs> awesome gear there. I love it. Um, let's um, talk about maybe you know, now that you've been doing it for quite a while and you've seen different aspects of, you know, the mastering world, you've been in different spaces, been in different rooms. Are there any things that you, upon reflection, wish you did differently or that you would have changed or anything like that? I don't think so. I think the the path that I went on was quite unique, I think, compared to a lot of engineers. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people get to go straight into a top end yeah. mastering room and learn. Yep. Um, so in terms of changing things, that part's a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think in hindsight, I, as you know, mastering will always be my first craft and my mm -hmm. first love. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, still focusing and honing my other skills in mixing and recording as well. Yep. Because Australia, the industry is small. You mm -hmm. can't really survive on just one part no, alone. Absolutely. Um, as as much as, you know, the Steves and the Leon Zervoses of the world can, yeah. they come from a different time. Yeah. And, you know, that's great, but it's it's not a reflection of where we are now. When you're first starting up, yeah, yeah. absolutely not. You yeah. need to be able to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I am still old school in that I I don't think you should mix and master in the same room mm -hmm. and I don't think you should be an engineer who mixes and masters the same work. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I do it, but I have two different rooms. Yeah. 
and I'll, I'll mix it and then I'll wait a week and cool. then I'll go master it in another yeah. space. Not, not everybody, you know, like yeah. they might not have that opportunity to mm -hmm. have two spaces, yeah. but I think still honing your skills in recording, mixing, mastering, mm -hmm. production, writing, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. chipping away at all of them mm -hmm. takes a lot of time for sure. Yep. Um, but I think I, I've left recording and mixing to the side and mm. I only mix those who I want to mix. Sure. I don't mix anyone who just cold yeah, calls yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and they're people that I know very well, so it's easy work. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, you know, put me in front of the Neve 88R again in studio one. I can use it, but <laughs> it's been years, yeah. you know, I feel rusty. So yeah. Definitely like would need anything, an assistant yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Very good. Well, let's start to wrap it up. I want to, I want to, um, I ask this of every guest is, can I get your best piece of advice for first of all engineers and then secondly for any artists that might be listening? For engineers, I would say one, don't be afraid to ask questions and be vulnerable in not knowing things. Mm -hmm. And two, Leave the tall poppy syndrome at the door. Mm -hmm. It's it's rampant in Australia mm. and I think it's to our detriment mm. that we have that. Mm. For artists, you know, learn or kind of get an understanding of what we do. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be super technical, but it helps us and it helps your own work yep. to learn how to communicate with us properly yep. um, as much as you can come in and say, oh, I'd love this to sound blue and as cool as the summer day and, you know, that's great. <laughs> but when it comes to would you like your reverb tail to be dark or bright or would you like it compressed or, you know, just having a bit of an understanding of just the basics, yep. just a little bit, just helps everyone mm -hmm. to make a song a lot better. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is watch a video or two on YouTube. It's yeah. not, it's not much, <laughs> yeah, you know, true. I've, I've had a lot of artists where they will, you know, they've come in oh, as blue as the summer's day and, yeah. and I'm sitting there going, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> very poetic. But... Very poetic. And I get it because you're an artist and yeah. this is how your creative brain works. Mm -hmm. But this is the tech side mm -hmm. now and yeah. it is creative, but yeah. we need no. to help each other out. I think communication is a huge part of any yeah. relationship and the one between an engineer and, and an artist is it's so, so important because at yep. the end of the day that determines what the outcome is like yep. more than most other things. Oh yeah. A good yeah. relationship yeah. should be the bottom line mm -hmm. for every engineer, mm -hmm. artist, you know, anything yep. really like my best work has come from being, I, you don't even have to be good friends, but mm. being on a level where you can communicate with each other. And that's mm -hmm. something I do foster with every client is that I try and get that communication going from the get go. Yep. And I'll follow up with them and I'll check in and, yep. you know, even just making sure you're still communicating on yeah. socials after you've done their work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really uh, it's, important. It's a huge part of it. And like you said, checking in is like just, it just got, goes such a long way, you know, and, and even and I think especially for artists is like, I think they need to do the checking in as well. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, as us as a service provider, it is definitely more important, but it just can't hurt. It can't hurt at all. Like yeah. it just, it just can't hurt it to can't. stay in touch with it, with people. Yeah. Like you just never know what the future is going to bring. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Definitely opens doors. That's it. Well, on that note, what's, what's the future bring for you? <laughs> well, uh, tomorrow I'll be at the awards. Yep. Good luck. Um, thank you. Honestly, like the five of us or who have been nominated or yeah. four, four or five, mm -hmm. we're all amazing. And just to, you know, show that mastering is still an art form yeah. is really exciting and not Absolutely. just AI anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm just grateful that we're getting that recognition in our little niche field. Yeah. So that's tomorrow, then back to Sydney and yep. just continuing with the freelancing. I mean, mm -hmm. I've got a lot of work coming up. It's mm -hmm. still been quite busy, which is nice. Awesome. And uh, dialing in my room mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and getting yeah. to a stage where, I, you know, I'm listening 100% comfortably, sit down, yep. you know, and get to work. Love it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a good chat. You're welcome. Um, 
for all of you. Thank you for checking this out. If you've made it this far, do us a favor. Make sure you share it around on your socials, in a conversation, in a DM, whatever that looks like. Spread the word. We want to get this out to as many people as possible. Make sure you hit follow or subscribe on whatever platform you are checking this out on. That way you can stay up to date with everything that's new in What's That Sound. But yeah, thank you again and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to What's That Sound. Make sure you hit follow or subscribe on your podcast platform to stay up to date with each new episode. We'll catch you next time.